Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Hello, Warbirders. Are you a World of Warbirds fan? If so, please help keep the podcast going by supporting it through PayPal at WOWB17. I can't tell you how much of a lift I get when I get an email from PayPal telling me that someone enjoys the show enough to send support. And I'd rather not start putting stuff behind a paywall or bringing in a subscription system. I'm a podcast listener myself, and I hate those things. Anyway, it really encourages me to get your support, and I do thank you to those who have sent it. Design and Development I had always thought that this bomber had come from the same specification that brought about the Avro Manchester slash Lancaster and the Handley Page Halifax. But no, specification B1236 was seeking a four-engine heavy bomber with 250 miles per hour cruise, 1,500 mile range, and a 14,000 pound bomb load. Although several companies decided to start work on this aircraft, two emerged as serious contenders. You might be surprised at the one that was thought to be the leading contender. The Supermarine Type 316, which was to be the Spitfire's four-engined heavy bomber cousin. When I first heard about the Type 316... I imagined an alternate version of history with fleets of these supermarine heavies, escorted by supermarine Spitfires, heading over on deep penetration raids. But it was not to be. R.J. Mitchell, the designer of both the Spit and the Type 316, became sick with cancer and was obliged to give up work in 1936. He died in 1937. Work did continue on the Supermarine Bomber, and two prototypes were ordered in March 1937. These prototypes were still being built when the Supermarine factory at Woolston was bombed by the Luftwaffe on 26 September 1940. Perhaps even worse than the destruction of the prototype machines was the loss of the construction plans. Two months later, the Air Ministry cancelled the order for the Supermarine Bomber, and that was that. Don't worry, Supermarine did okay with their other products. Actually, what would you think of an episode on what the Supermarine Bomber could have been? Let's back up a little bit and head back over to Shorts. They had already had lots of experience with building big four-engine aircraft, and were actually working on a couple of four-engine flying boats at the time, the Empire and Sunderland Flying Boats. Here would be a good time to remind you of the Sunderland episode, just in case you haven't partaken already. So the requirements for specification B-1236 were a little more than I mentioned before. The Air Ministry was not just looking for a bomber capable of 250 miles per hour cruise, 1500 mile range, and 14,000 pound bomb load. It also needed to be able to take off from backcountry airfields using only a 500-foot runway and be able to clear the classic 50-foot obstacle at the end of the runway. To aid in this takeoff, it should be able to use catapult assistance for takeoff when heavily loaded. Also, the design should be able to be broken down into sections for rail transport. It was imagined that the aircraft could be used as a troop transport to fly 24 soldiers to the ends of the British Empire and then supply them with tactical bombing air support. Lastly, it should come installed with a partridge in a pear tree. Okay, that last bit is made up. But even though Shorts had to try to meet the stringent and you might say outlandish requirements, they did have a leg up. The Short Sunderland was a four-engined flying boat about the right size for the bomber, and so they just copied chunks of it for the new plane, including the wings and the control systems. In February 1937, 
the Air Ministry asked for some changes to the, the design, asking if the Bristol Hercules radial engine could be used. Also, because of existing hangar infrastructure, the maximum wingspan had to be reduced from the Sunderland's 114 to 100 feet. In June of the same year, the Air Ministry asked for two prototypes. Although they still considered the Shorts aircraft, which was now called the S-29, to be the backup to the Supermarine Bomber. Prototypes in order to make the shorter wingspan work, the new wing had to have an increased camber, or thickness, to generate more lift to compensate for the reduced span. As a kind of stopgap pre-prototype, Shorts built a half-size but flyable model of the new bomber, and it first flew on the 19th of September 1938. They were mostly happy with the plane's performance, except for the takeoff run, which was too long. In order to improve this, there were a couple of options. One would be to redesign the angle of incidence of the actual wing, essentially increasing the angle at which it was bolted onto the fuselage, which would create more lift during the takeoff roll, thus shortening said roll. But there were some disadvantages to doing this. The main one being that it would require some major design changes, which in turn would need for the production line to be adapted, which would slow the delivery of the aircraft. Also, the same type of fix had been used on the twin-engine Armstrong Whitworth Whitley, which obliged it to fly with a serious nose-down attitude when in cruise. Apart from looking somewhat silly, this resulted in a considerable drag penalty on the Whitley. So Schwartz went with another option, which was to lengthen the landing gear legs. This pushed the nose higher and effectively increased the angle of attack of the wing on takeoff. They tried it on the scale model, and it worked. The long landing gear legs and resulting way up there cockpit is definitely an obvious characteristic to recognize the Sterling. Anyway, the Air Ministry was happy and ordered the S-29 before the full-scale prototypes had even flown. The type was given the name Stirling after the city in Scotland. One folk etymology of the name of the city says that Stirling is a Scots or Gaelic term meaning a place of battle, struggle, or strife, which was a pretty fitting name for the plane, I guess. On the 14th of... May 1939, the first Sterling prototype took to the air. All was well until this prototype suffered a locked break on landing, which made the bomber veer off the runway, causing the long, spindly landing gear to collapse. Changes were made on prototype number two in order to beef up the gear, but the long gear would always be a bit of a problem. Although it had a similar wingspan to the Avril Lancaster and the Handley Page Halifax, the Sterling was about 20 feet longer and was taller. Unlike both the Lank and the Halibag, the Sterling was designed from the start to be powered by four engines, which were the Bristol Hercules radials. The Bristol Hercules was a 14-cylinder, air-cooled, sleeve-valved radial engine that delivered 1,500 horsepower each. These engines turned a three-bladed, fully feathering, constant speed metal propeller. This power allowed it to have an impressive bomb load of 14,000 pounds or 6.25 tons. Care was taken to reduce drag by using flush rivets and by fitting panels so that there would be no exposed edges. There were three main fuel tanks in each wing, along with a leading edge tank and two trailing edge tanks, this giving 2,254 gallons of fuel. If even more was needed, six more auxiliary ferry tanks could be installed in the wing bomb cells to add another 220 gallons. Typically, the Sterling was to be operated by a crew of seven, including two pilots, a flight engineer, a navigator slash bomb aimer, a front gunner slash wireless operator, and two other gunners. While looking at the operating manual, 
I noticed that the throttles were listed to be of the, in quotes, exactor type, and required special attention. I had never heard of this type of throttle and did some more research on it, and it seems that rather than having a mechanical linkage between the throttle lever to the engine, the link was actually made via a hydraulic tube, and the throttles had to be pulled through in a certain sequence to make sure that the hydraulic fluid was topped up and there would be no lag in throttle control. For protection, the Sterling mounted eight 303 Browning machine guns. Two were in the powered nose turret. That would be manned by the wireless operator. Four were in the tail turret, and two in the dorsal turret. These would both be operated by dedicated gunners. Guarding the belly area was more of a problem. Initially, a so-called ventral dustbin turret was installed, which, as its name suggests, looks like a garbage can that is lowered out of the belly of the aircraft while in flight. The gunner sat within this cramped cylinder and would be able to operate his two guns in a 360 degree arc. However, it looks as though it would generate considerable drag and also the turret had the unfortunate habit of falling out when the aircraft was taxiing over rough terrain. It was usually removed and replaced by a hatch with a pair of machine guns installed. Later models could have that space occupied by a low-drag, remotely controlled FN-64 ventral turret, which was operated from within the aircraft by a gunner looking through a periscope device. An H-2S radar radome could also be installed instead for pathfinder duties, which will be explained later. Production The first order for Sterling's had been for 100 aircraft, but as the diplomatic situation with Nazi Germany worsened, this number was bumped up considerably to 1,500. In order to help out, automobile manufacturers such as Austin Motors and Roots were also tasked with building Sterling's, and eventually there would be 20 factories building the type. There were some plans to build Sterling's in Canada, and in 1941, a contract for 100 and 40 aircraft was drawn up, but in the end the decision was made to produce Avro Lancasters in Canada instead. On the other side of the ledger, Stirling production facilities suffered bombing attacks by the Luftwaffe during the Battle of Britain. But, all told, 2,371 Stirlings were built during the war. Operational History Number 7 Squadron at RAF Leeming, North Yorkshire, was the first to receive production sterlings in August 1940, and by January 1941, they were considered operational, with the first combat mission going out on the night of 10 to 11 February. During 1941, 150 more machines were supplied to three more squadrons, and they were used in a variety of night and day roles. Day missions, where masses of RAF fighters would accompany the bombers, mainly to provoke a fight with the Luftwaffe, were called circuses. The Sterlings were good for this type of mission, as, being the bait, they could take quite a bit of punishment and still get home, while the RAF fighters could try to bring down their Luftwaffe opposites. Sterlings were often the pioneers of techniques that would be exploited later by the Lancasters and Halifaxes. One of these was the formation of the Pathfinder Force, or PFF. Perhaps we should delve into this topic a bit. To avoid getting blasted out of the air during daylight hours, the RAF had started bombing by night. But night is a two-edged sword. It hides you in the darkness but it also hides the target. Now, when I started working on my night rating as a young pilot, I was surprised that the navigation was actually easier by night. The yellow blobs that represent built-up areas on aviation charts actually look just like that at night, as contrasted against the dark countryside. When climbing out of one town or city airport, by the time I reached cruise, I could often see the glow of my destination on the horizon. 
Of course, I also had the use of radio aids to navigation, described by a trio of three-letter acronyms, VORs, ADFs, and GPS, all of which provided helpful needles or pointers to tell me where to go. Contrast this with wartime Europe. It was nothing like this. Firstly, cities were blacked out as a matter of course, virtually eliminating the lights from homes, buildings, street lamps, and vehicles. Germany would also cut the electricity to areas under RAF attack. So RAF pilots and navigators, who were often fairly new to their jobs anyway, had great difficulty in finding their targets. Also, at least in the very beginning, they did not have any electronic aids to help them to find where they were going. In August 1941, a devastating survey was published that showed that during RAF raids on Germany, only 1 in 10 aircraft ever flew within 5 miles of its target. Half of all the bombs dropped by RAF bombers fell in open country, and only 1% of all the bombs were even in the vicinity of the target. With the vast output of blood and treasure going into this effort, something had to be done. There was great debate on what to do. Some wanted the squadrons involved to be competing against one another in a kind of contest to see who was best. This was rejected. When new electronic aids to navigation were developed, such as G, the problem was that there were not enough units for all the aircraft. One idea was to have Pathfinder aircraft equipped with G in each squadron to help the others in the unit find the target. This also was rejected as it was decided that it would not clearly mark the target enough for all the rest of the bombers. In the end, it was decided that entire squadrons, including the pioneering Sterling No. 7 Squadron RAF, would become Pathfinders, and this began in August 1942. After experiment and experience, the technique settled into PFF illuminators using white target illumination flares to mark the route to the target. There, other PFF aircraft would identify the actual target and drop colored target indicators, or TIs. Lastly, backers up, or fire starters, would drop incendiary bombs to start fires in the proper location of the target area. The main force would then arrive, and everybody would aim for the fires. Generally, Sterlings had their advantages and their disadvantages. One major complaint was the behavior of the aircraft during takeoff and landing. All of the tail dragger bombers of the time had a tendency to swing during takeoff. But the swing of the Sterling was particularly bad and was made worse by the long-legged landing gear, which could collapse. In order to counteract the swing, the right engine throttles needed to be advanced farther than the left during the first segment of the takeoff roll. Landing was tough too, as the Sterling had a habit of stalling during the landing flare and so dropping so hard as to damage the structure. At least during the hard landings, the aircraft wouldn't normally be loaded with explosive bombs and flammable fuel. The RAF was forced to bring in a special training program to certify all prospective Sterling pilots. On the other hand, pilots loved that due to the wing design of the Sterling, the bomber was able to turn very tightly, so much so that they would often outturn the German night fighters that were hunting them in the dark. What the pilots didn't love was due to the same thick wing, the Sterling wasn't able to operate above 16,000 feet, while the newer Halifaxes and Lancasters could get up to 24,000 and 28,000 feet respectively. The Sterlings were literally low-hanging fruit for the German night fighters. Another serious disadvantage that the Sterling shared with the Halifax was that its bomb bay was subdivided into smaller bomb cells, rather than having a massive bomb bay like the Lank. The biggest bomb that a Sterling could fit into its cells was a 2,000-pounder. Although this may sound impressive, the RAF began using significant number of 4,000-pound bombs, These were called cookies for some reason, and the Sterling just couldn't do this job. 
The Halifaxes and Lancasters could, and the Lancs could even carry the 8,000-pound versions as well as the eventual Tallboys and Grand Slam bombs. As the number of more useful Halifaxes and Lancasters arrived on the scene, Stirlings began to take on other roles. Even the pioneering No. 7 Squadron RAF handed in their Stirlings for Lancasters in May 1943. But Stirlings continued doing useful work. They dropped naval mines in the waters off of German ports, an operation known as gardening. They were used in electronic countermeasure missions, dropping strips of metal foil into the air to confuse German radar for operations such as D-Day and Market Garden. They also carried paratroopers and they towed gliders. In 1944, a transport variant of the Sterling known as the Mark V was built with no tail turret and a new nose hatch installed. 160 of them were built. Before we finish up, we need to mention the S-36 Super Sterling. Back in 1941, Shorts already started making plans for a follow-up to the Sterling. It would have an increased wingspan of 135 feet and be powered by four Bristol Centaurus radials, which would deliver much more power at about 2,000 horsepower each. It would have a greater payload and be protected with 10 50 caliber machine guns in three turrets. The Air Ministry liked the idea and toyed with the concept by ordering two prototypes. However, as time went on, the decision was made to focus on increasing the production of Lancasters instead. In August 1942, Shorts stopped working on the Super Sterling. Survivors It's pretty disappointing that of the 2,371 Sterlings constructed, there is not one single intact example existing anywhere, let alone having one in an airworthy or even taxiing condition. Sections of Sterlings are on display in France and the Netherlands. But for an aircraft that was such a pioneer for the RAF bombing effort, and which did such solid service throughout the conflict, it does seem a real loss that nowhere can we lay our eyes on this giant aircraft that certainly would be very impressive to see. Thanks for listening. You can check out some pictures of Sterlings on the World of Warbirds Facebook page. And if you want another easy way to help support the podcast, simply look for and click on my postings of some related items of merchandise available from Amazon. You don't even have to buy. Just by clicking on the links gives me some revenue with no obligation to you. Thank you. And until next time. World of Warbirds is researched, written, and recorded by me, Brian Pierce. The music is the Royal Canadian Air Force March Past. Thanks for listening.